Well, hello there, everybody, and uh, welcome to yet another enlightening and, yes, edifying fall publishing webinar. I am Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks Magazine and Green Profit Magazine and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next so hour or so as we tackle today's topic, I hope you see it on your screen, overcoming PGR overdoses. Now, if you're a, a grower, chances are you use PGRs, plant growth regulators, uh, on something that you grow, and if you do, you need to be aware of the signs of PGR overdose. Uh, and we've got the guy who's going to help you with that. Now, I have applied plenty of B9, Cycosel, and Bonsai, and things like that back in my grower days, but I am not an expert on the topic. Uh, but I know who is, and he's here with us today. He is Dr. Brian Whipker of North Carolina State University. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. A great day in Raleigh. We're 73 degrees and kind of partly sunny, but at least it's warming up. You know what? I, I was going to ask you where you're broadcasting from, but I wish uh, you didn't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Spring has come. But I've the got, students we, are we gone a, this week. We have attendees from the from the from the north, possibly some from frostbite falls. They don't want to hear about 70 degrees. But actually, it's pretty nice here in Chicago too, as a matter of fact, which is uh, where I'm broadcasting from. Uh, I am uh, Chris Bates, as I said, your host, and I'm broadcasting from high atop the ball publishing tower in Chicago, where spring is finally in the air. Now, uh, real quick, I want to give a special thank you to our sponsor for today's webinar, Fine Americas, Excellence in PGR Technology. They put the free in free webinar, so thank you, Fine, the fine folks at Fine. Uh, and as we go along here, uh, you may have questions. Brian's uh, talk is going to be pretty detailed. I can pretty much guarantee you're going to have questions. Um, if you have them, use the little uh, chat area that you see on the uh, on the right hand side of your screen somewhere. There's also a Q and A area that you can use, but it's easier for me if you just use the chat. Otherwise, I'm looking in two different spots. But uh, we'll manage it one way or another. We'll either ask them uh, kind of as we go along if they're pertinent to the, to the specific topic Brian is on, or we'll save them for the end. Uh, and as always, if something happens, you get called away, a customer comes in, or you get disconnected, uh, heaven forbid, uh, all of our webinars, including this one, uh, will be archived at uh, fallpublishing.com forward slash webinars, the same place that you, uh, that you signed up for this, uh, this puppy. So uh, that said, uh, Brian, are you all set? I am ready. All right. Well, take it away, my friend. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. So, uh, like I said, weather's great here in Raleigh, and uh, sun's coming out, and so it's a good weather to be using plant growth regulators. So sometimes, though, if you add a little too much, what do you do about it? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So in the next slide, we're looking at overdoses. So, you know, you know that a PGR is an excellent tool to manage growth. That's why you're using it. You get the plant proportional to plant pot size. But sometimes maybe you get the rate a little too high and, and you have stunted growth. So what are we going to be doing about it? And so in the next slide, you can see that uh, when you have a problem, you need to be able to recognize what those overdose symptoms are. But, you know, sometimes, and I, I do a lot of diagnostics for growers, that people say, well, I have a PGR overdose. Uh, there's, the problem is there's a few other mimics out there that you need to be aware of that can also look surprisingly like a PGR overdose. So we're going to talk about what those look like. And then finally, if you have a problem, how can you go about correcting it? So that's what we're going to cover today. So the, the main items are recognizing the signs of a PGR overdose, recognizing the mimics that you would see for some other problems that look like a PGR overdose, go over going over how to get the dose right, and then we've done a study of looking at uh, paclobutrazole being in a residual and irrigation water. How do you overcome that problem? Corrective procedures, and then finally touch on some PGR resources that are out there that are useful if you're trying to calculate some of the rates uh, to get those things right. So to start off with, let's look at recognizing the signs of a PGR overdose. The symptoms 
can mimic a lot of other things. So, you know, as long as you start off with getting the dose right, uh, getting the math right, that helps avoid the problem. And one good way to do that is the PGR calculator that we came up with. It's on the University of New Hampshire website. You can see the address there or just Google search University of New Hampshire uh, PGR calculator and it will come up as one of the numerous calculators that are on the website that Brian Krug has put up there at University of New Hampshire. So when we get the rates right, what we're gearing towards is controlling excessive stretch. We want that plant proportional to pot size, and you know the advantage of that is that then we can have tighter spacing so you can get more uh, plants per unit area, so it cuts down your fixed cost. And you also have the advantage that you have a darker green foliage when the rate's right, and you have less water use. So those are all advantages of using a PGR, and that's why people are using them. When the rates are too high, though, the problems can begin. And what we're looking at is stunted plants, the lack of leaf expansion or stem expansion occurring, in some cases with some of the PGRs, there can be flower delay or a smaller size flower being there. So you don't have that flower power that you're looking for. And in extremely high conditions or uh, rates, you can have poor establishment in the landscape. But that, that's, you know, a lot of times if the rate's just marginally high, we have seen that once that plant goes in the landscape and the roots get out into the soil, that plant can then start growing out of that PGR effect as long as it's not too high. Now, if you really nailed it, those roots don't grow and that plant has a hard time getting established. And in many cases we have seen, uh, those plants actually die because they, they can't get enough water when the heat comes because the root system's too small. So those are all symptoms. So here's some typical symptoms here when the control is a little too high on the plant on the, on the right. You can see that it's more compact, it's darker green um, colorations there, but it's probably a little more growth control than most people want. And you can look then at the, the growing tip of that plant and you can see that the bud's not expanding. Some of those flowers are not fully elongating also when, when you get the rate a little too high. And in some cases with some PGRs, you can't have some bleaching of the flowers and so and they're not quite as big. Again, the plant or the flower <laughs> excuse me, the flower that's on the right is the case. So I said that you can have problems of flower size being reduced and we saw that with the pansy in the previous slide. But also if there are some PGRs that you might not get <laughs> excuse me. Not, might not get um, the flower reduction. Here's the case here. We did some work with top floor. You can see obviously the plant growth was controlled because Easter lilies aren't supposed to have only six inches of foliage. But amazingly, the flower size is not affected. So it doesn't always, um, it's not always the case that these problems occur of the flowers being smaller. So what we're looking at here, or the optimal, is to have consistent effect. And you can see with all those plants that they're pretty well the same, a similar amount of growth, and that's what we're targeting. But in, <coughs> but in the case when the rate is a little too high or there's an uneven application of a drench, the plant on the, the left looks normal, but what happens to the plant on the right? In the case there, the drench application, and when you look at drenches, it's very important to regulate how many fluid ounces or milliliters you're adding to a pot. And if you double the number of milliliters or ounces, you're going to double the PGR dose, and then you can lead to an overdose condition like we see at the plant on the Brian, right. quick question from Lindsay going back to the Easter lily. Uh, wants to know if that's due to spraying too early. But this was no an overdose? Uh, uh, that was actually either a drench or a pre-plant bulb soak. Uh, on Easter lilies, there is some, 
information in the literature that says if you apply the PGR too early, you're going to affect bud count and size. But with all the work we did with top floor, which included pre-plant soaks, um, we did not see a negative effect on flower size, diameter, or bud count. I, we, we did get some negative effects if we were like 4X too heavy, and you'd expect that. But at normal rates that we were looking at, we did not see that effect. All right. Let's see. Where were we? Right here. Yeah, we're here. So here's some plants from my greenhouse. We bought some plugs in last year. And so this is typical symptoms of uh, some PGR overdose. And you can see that crinkling leaves, the lack of leaf expansion. Uh, if you fill those plants, they're going to be uh, pretty stiff. Uh, and then on the next slide, you can see that um, we planted some in a six-inch pot. So it's kind of hard to do an experiment when half your flat is overdose of PGR and the other, other half was not. And you can see here that, you know, it, it was a PGR overdose. It got oversprayed uh, by the plug producer. And so that, that, in this case here with a six-inch six pot, that's really tough to overcome uh, with any type of treatment because trying to spray to overcome that is going to be extremely difficult. So this was not part of an experiment. This is how some plugs came into you, huh? Yes. We were doing a tissue experiment. We wanted to do tissue standards. Um, needless to say, we got to do it over again. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we, uh, we, we just got better because we got to do it twice. Now, we'd be extremely um, uh, intelligent if we had to do it three times. We only had to do it twice. But anyway, that's a PGR overdose that you're looking at there on the two plugs on the on the front. All right. And then, you know, some plants are extremely sensitive to PGR overdoses or any, any sprays. Begonias, wax begonias is one of the most sensitive. And you can see the plants on the left had some PGR get to them, whereas the plants on the right did not. And so the other plants that had that sensitivity or extreme sensitivity would be uh, many of the pansies and also vinca. And so you need to make sure you read the label to see whether or not those three crops are listed on the label for that particular chemical. Because some of the more uh, potent ones, like uh, uniconazole, some of the paclobutrazoles, and uh, uh, top floor fluoroprimidol do not have, or in some cases, bego wax begonias, vinca. Uh, most of them have pansies on the label, though. So you just got to be aware of the sens relative sensitivity of some of these, these different species. So that was covering some of the symptoms we notice when a PGR overdose happens. So then what are some of the mimics that we're typically looking at? So, you know, you need to be able to go through and recognize the difference between those two. And so, and then knowing what the symptoms look like for a herbicide drip. And, and we're really looking at a 2,4-D type of a herbicide, not Roundup. A Roundup herbicide will cause yellowing at the growing tip. Uh, at small doses, you don't get the distorted growth like you do with a 2,4-D type of a herbicide. Boron deficiency is also common. And then also fraud or cyclamides. Cyclamide, cyclamin mites can be a problem. So with the first slide here, you can see this is a vinca plant. It has really distorted growth. And this resulted in some herbicide drift coming in the greenhouse. And so, you know, a lot of times you can see a pattern that's there. Uh, many times the symptoms are more severe, closer to the intake vents. But if the, the, but if the application occurred right outside that greenhouse fan, you'll get pretty well uh, a complete distribution of those vapors throughout the entire greenhouse. So there's not a, a set rule of trying to diagnose the problem because there's some exceptions there. Then on the next slide, you can see here, this was um, a nice crop of poinsettias. Uh, this was right around the start of short days. Um, see, down in North Carolina, uh, Yard grass doesn't do very well. It's so hot, and so I I think that the the, nat, the the state month of renovating lawns is in the month of September, 
And so that's when people will go through and use a 2,4-D type of herbicide on the lawn, and that vapor can spread. This, the vapor here came from the neighbor's pasture when they were renovating the pasture, uh, getting, in, uh, getting ready for the winter time. And so in this case, there was a clear pattern. The ones closest to the vent were most severely affected. There were some houses that the, the vents were on the uh, opposite side from the field, and, and you can clearly see the, the pattern there. Those that were parallel had symptoms more completely through the entire house. Now, ironically, some, they had some stock plants, and that 2,4-D caused, let's say, you can see how many shoots are there. I want to say for a stock plant, it had three to 400 different shoots because of that effect, and it was the most amazing poinsettia. I saved it and bloomed it, so it was covered with a bunch of like three-inch diameter uh, bracts that went across. So it was it was a cool effect, but it's not registered for that use, so I wouldn't try it. So. <laughs> you, you did say when you started this, you said this was a nice, a beautiful poinsettia crop. There's obviously yes, no yes. way to save the crop when this happens, especially in the September, I guess, or October, huh? Correct. Because um, typically when I run into a problem like this, I, you know, because that question comes up, can I save the crop? And, you know, you, you need to have a, the right answer. So typically I'll grab some of those plants and we'll grow them on out. Uh, the very severe ones never did form up very nicely. Uh, some of the marginal ones uh, were okay. But that, it, for this particular person, one house was an 80% loss. The other one was probably a 20% loss, um, so it's 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 better to throw out uh, and get something else in there than than trying to carry it on through. Uh, the lesson here is keep an eye on your neighbors. Yes, but as the slide says here, when you're looking at at 2,4-D type herbicides, when you try to de determine the source, you know the first thing you have to ask whether or not you applied it. And in most cases, you know, growers know what the effects of, of 2,4-D will be. And so there's no way they're going to apply 2,4-D anywhere close to the greenhouse. And, you know, this, and the, the next point there, drift, it's not uncommon for the drift to come a mile. And I will get growers looking at me saying, you're crazy. And, you know, most falls I run into two problems a year on average. Uh, of, of PGR or of, of herbicide drift, and, and it is not uncommon for it to come a mile uh, on some of those uh, products. So look for the pattern. Again, severe symptoms usually uh, are, are associated closer to the vent, and less severe will be further away down by the cool cells. Um, so down by the fan, it, 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 as long as it wasn't a high dose right outside the greenhouse. And, and typically, the, and I didn't put it on the slide, but you're going to see most plants in the greenhouse with some effects. And that's a key there uh, when you're looking at things uh, to try to diagnose the problem. So the next common mimic is boron deficiency. You can see here with this um, impatient that the growing tip in the very middle has aborted out, and then you can see two small nodes of growth, and then there's a secondary shoot coming that's just a little lower. That's a very typical symptom of boron deficiency when you get those axillary shoots coming up. And on the next slide, you can see that there's here's distorted leaves, the thicker on these gerbera, and you can also see the symptoms on the two slides on, on the right, that this is during the plug stage that the symptoms actually have started, then it got transplanted into a bigger pot. So distortion, odd-looking growth, you know, I, and I didn't, you know, that, you also, when it's this type of distortion, especially with, a, with a, like a Gerbera, you know, you do need to look for like uh, thrips damage, but you'll see the, the insects present and the feeding, you can get some distortion. But that thickening is, is one of the keys to look for with the boron deficiency. So with that, you are going to get the distorted growth with the boron deficiency and thicker leaves. And the key is many times if you put your hand and fill those plants, you'll be surprised at how hard they are and how brittle. 
there's been cases, you know, you can grab the plants and they, they just crunch on you on severe cases. And so when we're really looking at most problems of boron deficiency, you know, it probably is going to be down to a specific crop, not everything in that greenhouse. You're going to see the problems occur more likely during plug production, and especially when you have excess humidity conditions going on, because you don't get the transpiration, you don't get the uptake of that boron to the growing point, and then you run into problems. So increasing airflow a lot of times helps control the problem. Now, I put on there, confirm that your diagnosis with the tissue sample. That, um, um, uh, that, that, that doesn't always work because sometimes the tissue value, uh, the values are there. So it will help in some cases confirm it, but it won't do it in all times. Um, so the next one here is very just, uh, stunted growth. And, and notice that they're strapping of the leaves. There's uh, a proliferation of shoots and leaves coming from the growing tip. And that is the typical symptoms that you see with broad mites and or cyclamen mites uh, affecting the growing tip. And on the next photo, here is a, a hetera plant. Uh, that actually is from last week we found in a greenhouse. Now look at that plant. In the, the middle, you see the normal sized leaves. And then all the growth after that point is distorted. And so uh, typically, that, those are very typical symptoms that you'd see with broad mites, and that's what we found there. There's a close-up on the next slide. Uh, you can see, again, in the middle, it's the full-size leaves, and then you can start seeing the smaller ones. And finally, in the next slide, you can see how small and distorted that is. So, you know, you, you're going to have to get in there with a, a good magnifying glass to do the ID uh, with that. And on the next slide, you're probably going to need at least a 40X microscope in what you're looking for or the adults, or specifically when you're looking at broad mites, you're going to look for the eggs. So you'll have to do like a, um, I didn't put a photograph in there, but it's, a, it's an oval egg with pock marks in it. And online you can find what the symptoms are, what the, the egg looks like to help diagnose it. And, you know, a lot of times another way to help key into this is that it's typically, typically going to be a problem of a vegetatively propagated plant. And that's because uh, broad mite, cycle mite, and mites aren't on seeds. So they gotta be on, on cuttings that came off some other material. And then you'll, you'll see that going through the system. A lot of times we'll see symptoms worse during the winter uh, just because they, the, the, the broad mites need uh, high humidity in order for uh, the eggs to survive. Low humidity, they will die, and so uh, that can be problematic for them. Uh, and then, you know, if, if you looked at some of those branches, uh, you're going to have to look at the tips because typically they're moving out, and that's where you need to look at the new, newest growth for actually any mites <coughs> present. And for that particular plant, you, you could try cutting back to the normal growth. Those were very severe. Uh, those plants really have a hard time growing out of it because one year we had some broad mites. We infected some other ones. So I actually had a, a greenhouse that I tried to grow broad mites, and it worked very well. And the symptomology lasted uh, past an economic threshold that you would want to try to cut those plants back and reflush them out. It wasn't feasible. You better throw them out, and you're really not going to have a hard time getting those under control. So throw out and start again would be your best bet. So with mimics, you know, you need to uh, go through and do a test just to make sure that uh, what the problem is. Is it boron? Is it herbicide? Is it uh, uh, some type of a, a broad mite? And so just to make sure you can take that out of the list of being the problem, and if there is a, a PGR overdose, there's some corrective procedures that will help to overcome that. And we're going to go over that in the next few minutes. So I want to briefly go over getting the dose right because part of the, the strategy to avoid the problems is getting a, a good dose there uh, from the get-go. So there's a lot of PGRs in your toolbox. Um, so at least in the U.S., we have the widest assortment available. 
Uh, we had some European growers visiting two weeks ago, and half the chemicals uh, that were available or, or that we have, they, they had never heard of. And so we have a lot of tools that we could end up using. So when you're looking at doses on the next slide, uh, you know, we're trying to control the shoots. We're, we're also controlling the roots in many cases to get an optimal concentration that gives you that growth that control that you need. And so ideally, we're going to control that growth to be smaller. A rough ratio is, is a plant that's two to two and a half times taller than the pot. But, you know, a lot of the bedding plants, that doesn't necessarily uh, end up being the case but you get a standard there for what you need to end up doing. So to get there, though, the optimal dose varies quite a bit. And so the question is, why is that the case? And in the next slide, there's a lot of factors that influence the PGR activity. The first ones are the chemical you're using, you know, a, a more active PGR like a Sumagic or a Concise versus one like a uh, a deminazide, a B9, a daiside uh, that's going to be softer where you have to have more applications. And there's a lot of differences between the species that are out there, how reactive they are uh, to the PGRs. The next set of, of factors is the concentration, of course. The more you put on, the more control. The type of application, a drench versus a spray. Huge differences in cultivars uh, as far as they can re react. Some of the worst cases, of course, are, are going to be like the lilies. They're all over the board as far as uh, of, uh, trying to figure out an optimal rate for a particular chemical. And then the number of applications you make will affect the overall activity. The next set of information is how much light there is, how often you're irrigating, the stage of development, more control earlier on, if, if it's later in the, later in the season, or, or more uh, uh, overall growth has already occurred on that plant, you're going to need more. And then, of course, temperature affects it. Uh, the higher the temperatures, you're going to need more chemical. And then finally is fertilizer, application interval, and spacing. So all those factors play a part. The bigger the letters, I, the, to me, that has more effect. Uh, than uh, one that has smaller size uh, font size there. So all those factors that go into play. So if you want to control the growth, you've got to understand how the PGRs work. And there's a lot of factors we just covered that, that influence that efficacy. And so that's why with the next portion of the slide that, you know, you ask what rate to use, there's really an art and science of trying to decide which rates to use for some of these PGRs. And then, therefore, it is, it, it's kind of hard in some cases to get the rate right. It, it, it's not unusual to get an overdose until you figure out what that plant will take to get the optimal growth. So when we're looking at, it, at um, application techniques, of course, the main ones that we have on the next slide are foliar sprays and substrate drenches, and they vary in the ease and effectiveness. With the next slide, you know, when you're looking at foliar sprays, for the most part, we are applying um, a PGR for a foliar spray with about two quarts of water per 100 square feet. And that will give you basically to runoff. But that kind of comes down to a common rate that you can repeat. Now, if you want more of a sprench where you get more soil activity for the soil active PGRs, we're looking at three quarts per 100 square feet. That works for most of the PGRs and also helps on tank mixes. So, so the amount per area is important to follow to get the spray rates right to avoid an overdose. On the next slide, with trenches, you know, you're applying it to the substrate. It binds the substrate and releases it over time, and you get that absorption by the roots. So when you look at the list of what's there, uh, there's um, uh, deminazide doesn't have soil activity, GA we're not doing. Now, chloramaquat, like a cyclocell or citadel, does have a label for a drench, but unlike most of the other PGRs, when you start looking at rates, you don't get a increased efficacy, let's say, when you apply a drench, which means you can use a lower rate. That isn't, that's not the case with, with uh, uh, chloramaquat. 
uh, even though in Europe they use it quite a bit, they have a different percentage AI, uh, like in the 60s, and it's a very inexpensive chemical, but there's not a lot of else that's available. I think from the list that we have, we have a lot of superior products that that would be the choice. And with the next slide, the red boxes are the, the main ones to consider for drenches. Top floor, any of the Paclos, any of the Uniconazoles, and then once drench rates have been registered, the Ethafon products uh, would work very well. So with the next slide, you know, when you're doing drenches, you need to have a proper volume that you need for the pot size, and you need to apply it so that when it's applied, it doesn't run out the bottom, so it has to be at the stage where you need to irrigate it. Now, typically with bark, you increase the rate by 50%, but if you're sub-irrigating because of how it, 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 it is whipped up into the pot, you can lower the rate by 50%. So you have to play with those adjustments when you're looking at PGR applications. And, and Brian, for those who don't know, what's BMP? Best management practices. Thank you. Ah, so there we go. So just, just good practices, you know, baseline for, for applying a, a PGR drench. So rate recommendations do vary by pot size, and you can see as the pot diameter increases, the number of fluid ounces or mils also increase accordingly with the drench application, because you want to get a complete coverage across the entire root system. So you have to increase the amount of liquid you're adding to the bigger pots. So when, again, Volume depends on the application method. You need that uniform control or, or volume to get uniform application response. So if you, you can use volume as an application tool, but by increasing the volume of solution you're adding, you're going to increase the, the dosage and have more of the chemical available to plant. So you can play with it slightly if you know this cultivar, if you're doing drenches, is very responsive, you can back off a little on the amount of drench it's getting. And the ones that need slightly more, you can give it a, a, you know, a few more mils or a few more ounces. You can play with that a little to help customize your applications. But anytime you increase the volume, you're increasing the amount of, uh, of chemical you're adding to that plant. So then with the next slide, Hang on, Brian. We have a quick question on drenches while we're still here. Clark wants to know if you can uh, if you can drench with B9 or if that's strictly for foliar application. Uh, B9 is the minazide, it's the same as dayside. Uh, it is tied up by the substrate, and so it does not have activity uh, under those conditions. So it's not a drench applied chemical. Didn't think I'd ever heard of it drenched. So there you go. All right, some examples here. So here's here. just, yeah, so here just, you know, drench application. It's top floor and the bottom. Increase the rate, you get more control. The next slide, um, you know, here's some work from Joyce Latimer comparing an untreated control, a spray, and then the increased effect with the drench. So, you know, it works, you, you need to, need, but you need to get the rate right. Uh, for, and that's early on it would grow out. And here's a comparison of some osteos we did of a control in the upper left versus a cyclocell spray that worked very well, but it's a little more expensive compared to a top floor drench or a Sumagic drench. Uh, so again, drenches are, are good products, uh, but a lot of times it takes a little more time to make those applications. As I was so setting up this uh, slideshow, I wasn't sure what the what the dollar figures meant. I, I, I wondered if maybe that was the retail selling price based on the application <laughs> of PGR, but that's not the case. <laughs> That's the that's the price. I believe it was calculated on on a um, thousand plants to make that okay. treatment. All right. So now you, you can charge so fifteen seventy six for that bottom right plant. No. You could try it. I I, I bet you could sell it of any person well, I know, Chris. It's, it's a good it's a good looking plant. Sure. All right. Call me you if you'd like some. <laughs> okay. And then here's just some more effect. You know, drenches. I I just threw the slide in, so uh, they work. You all use drenches. So, so again, when we're looking at drench doses to get things right to avoid a, uh, an overdose, you need to measure out a known amount of chemical, add it to a known volume of water, and then apply a known volume to each pot. So with the next part of the slide, the first two items 
make the concentration of that solution, then how much you add is the volume, and then that gives you the dose. And so that is how a milligrams AI is calculated per pot, but not necessarily for, um, for a part per million. We're, we're a little weak on our recommendations when we say do this many part per million drench. We need to add in how many fluid ounces we're adding because uh, that will tell the, you know, that's the concentration of the solution, but not how much total dose that you're adding to the pot. And an example is that's in the next slide that, you know, of course we're adding uh, more volume as the pot size gets bigger. And with the next slide, uh, you know, milligrams take into account the volume difference of uh, the pot. And so the dose stays the same, stays the same across all the pot sizes with, as the amount of water increases. But with part per million, we're not doing that. So again, we need to keep in mind how many fluid ounces we're adding to a pot when we make those recommendations based on parts per million. So an example here is that a part per million is a milligram per liter, so milligrams per liter. So if you mix a solution that's 50 parts per million, then a liter contains 50 milligrams. So if you add 10 mils to a pot, then you're given 0.5 milligrams to that plant. If you add 100 milliliters to the pot, it's 5 milligrams, and if you add the whole liter, assuming the pot's big enough, of course, it's 50 milligrams. So you can see the quite a bit of difference that occurs with the dose you give it. So again, the volume matters when you're doing those PGR drenches, and you need those in those need to know that information on those recommendations. So in summary here, I went a lot over over the dose that, you know, know the fluid ounces the part per million, it's known with milligrams, and then you can accurately get that dose to those pots. So um, the next part, I wanted to share with you some of the um, uh, research we did with paclobutrazol in, in recirculating water. So with this study that Vine sponsored, we were looking at countering the effects of paclobutrazol residual and irrigation water with foliar sprays. So on the next slide, what we did was we were trying to mimic what was going on with wax begonias that received a low dose of paclo and then determine whether or not a fresco foliar spray would overcome that uh, effect. So with the next slide, we did begonias. They were 144 cells. Uh, we grew them in Fafford 1P, six replications. So just some baseline of the experiment. They were fertilized at each irrigation with 100 part per million nitrogen from a 17417. And, and those, that fertilizer, there were four tanks, and it had either zero, five, 10, or 50. Now that's PPB, parts per billion, not million, billion. And we use Piccolo 10X, and we irrigated them. Uh, to looks like a total of about uh, 10 times there, and there's the temperatures. Um, uh, so that gives you the baseline how we did the experiment. So, so Brian, was this based slide, on Brian? Was this based on on uh, common problems in say sub irrigation systems with Paclo being uh, applied as a drench and then picked up, or even as a spray and then picked up in the irrigation water? Is that why you're doing the research? Yes, there, there's been some. Um, um, some growers have asked about the effects of, of uh, paclobutrazol residual in the irrigation water, and there is a big research project being headed up by uh, Paul Fisher and some others looking at some of the other ways to remove it. Uh, the purpose of this experiment was until we got to the point of a good removal technique, what could we use to overcome this problem? And that's, that was why Fine asked me to do this experiment. And what is Fresco? I'm unfamiliar with that product. Fresco is the same as, uh, sorry, it has, it has similar uh, GA and BA combination as fascination. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll talk a little more detail about that in the last section here um, of the presentation. So. All right, okay. anything more on this slide? No. There we go. So we then, to counter the, the effects of the PACLO, we did fresco rates of either zero, one, three, or six parts per million. We applied it with the standard rate. That's basically equivalent to uh, uh, two quarts per 100 square feet. We did it twice, 
and then we let them grow out and get our measurements. So that gives, kind of gives you the background. So the results, so this, this is what we got. Uh, so this shows the effect with no fresco application that as you increase the pack low in the irrigation water from zero on the left to 50 on the right, you can see the dwarfing of the plant. And one's a side view and the, the upper slide is a top view. So of course, you're seeing quite a bit of control of those plants. So you're having that negative effect and that's what we're trying to overcome. With the next slide, you can see here that we hit every line, every row, uh, represents the amount of paclobutrazole that was applied from 0, 5, 10, and 50. Then on the bottom, so it would be every column, it had either 0, 1, 3, or 6 parts per million of fresco. So what's the take home here? At untreated control, the top row, with no fresco, you can see that the plant's smaller. As we add fresco, we get more growth, and that's how we're going to. That's how we overcome a PGR overdose. Interesting enough, with five parts per parts per billion pack low, it comes around to about three part. You have to apply three parts per million fresco at third plant over to get similar growth as the zero zero pack low fresco application on the top left hand corner. And so, consequently, you can see kind of the rates that you're going to need to overcome that paclobutrazole effect in the irrigation water. So we got some really good results that are applicable for growers to use to overcome this if they have the problem. So in the next slide is just another shot looking at it differently. So um, untreated control on the bottom uh, with no paclo and then the paclo rates, it's the inverse of the prior slide, but you can see the effects that are there. Uh, so, you know, Target in on the bottom row. If you're trying to increase growth, adding fresco or fascination is going to size those plants up bigger. So even one, one part per million applied twice gave you a much bigger plant than the untreated control. So you can size plants up and overcome any PGR overdoses that are there by using a fresco application. So the next slide is uh, shows too high of a rate you'll start seeing the yellowing and some stretch going on. So you can, you can counteract that, that ironically, what do you have to use? You have to go back and apply another PGR. So the PGR companies are happy because you're buying more plant growth regulator. But you, you, you can overdo it and you gotta kind of play around with regulating what's going on. You can whiplash from one too, too much control to too little to too much. So you just kind of have to be a, have some patience and, and use some moderation for what needs to go on. On the next slide, uh, kind of similar effects. I took these slides earlier in the week. Um, it's a current study, so we're not done with it yet. So you can see the same effect that as you increase the, the amount of paclobutrazole in irrigation water that might be circulating, again, that's parts per billion you're going to have stunted growth. And so we're trying to use some fresco, and, and the plants haven't grown out enough uh, for the end of the study uh, to yet have, have the results. So here's pansies or violas that are very sensitive. And the next slide is the, is the binca crop doing the same thing. Again, we need a few more weeks of growth. Uh, we're at least a week behind, not 10 days on normal growth because of how cloudy we've been. So they'll size up a little little better, and then we'll take our data off those plants. Brian, uh, Jason wants to know if there's any uh, timing issues with the fresco. When do you, when would you want to apply it? You're, okay, there's not a timing issue as far as, um, you know, you know, like a floral, floral application, you're concerned of, of knocking off flowers and you need not do it uh, six weeks out. There's not the case that's here. Now, on on a continual growing plant, like any of the most of the bedding plants, you just have to apply it and then give give enough time for it to, the plant to grow out of the 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 anti GA PGR, so you can size it up to sell it. So that's that's a timing factor of planning ahead if if you're seeing the plant is, is in fact stalling. Uh, now. 
Well, flip that around, if you're doing this type of treatment on a poinsettia with a terminal bud and your nodes are already set back in September, you have to make that application to increase the size of that plant early enough that you can cause the, that distance between the nodes to stretch. If you do it too late, there's nothing there that you can stretch. And so, uh, and there is some concerns, especially with foliar sprays on red poinsettias, that you might have a little bleaching effect. And that's where some of the recommendations are for doing drench applications on poinsettias for more even control. All right, a couple more questions. Uh, Mao Wang wants to know, let's see, says that Fascination or Fresco, we're talking about Fresco, so we'll address that, contains uh, GA and BA. GA stimulates plant growth. What exactly does the BA do to the plants? The, the and does BA it have the same effect as ethophon? Somewhat from the standpoint that it encourages axillary shoot development. Um, and that you'll, you'll get that effect after the, re, the release of ethylene with ethophon. I mean, there, there are two different modes of action, so, but, but the end result of what you want is somewhat similar. So you're, and, and I, I got some other slides here at the end on, on corrective procedures, and so let, let's, let's hold off the rest of that question until then, and if I don't get it answered, by all means come back and ask again. So. Uh, all right. Um, so basically, we, we the conclusions are there is detrimental effect of that low residual uh, PGR in the water supply, and, and growers have complained about that. And, and you know, there's that research project headed headed up by Paul Fisher that's that's working on this also. So it is there, uh, and and using some PGRs if it's a low rate, about one part per million applied twice work great. If it's a higher rate of of pack low. Uh, basically three part per million twice work very well. Uh, so you're going to have to kind of look and see what's going on. So to get in those corrective procedures that are here, the, with the next slide, the, um, you know, you can increase the fertilization rate, especially ammoniacal and phosphorus to try to get the growth, increase temperatures, but really the other tool you have is to apply a growth stimulating PGR. So the next slide has your options. Uh, you can use straight BA, but it's, it's, it's really not the product of choice. Uh, and straight GA, uh, that's listed there. Now that's a GA3, it's a slightly different GA than what we see with Fresco or Fascination. That's a GA47 uh, in a BA combination. So both the GA and the GA-BA products have labels that allow for this overcoming of the PGR overdose. If it's my crop, I would only use the combination. Uh, the, the thing is, it's like, like a race car, and you slammed on the brakes and the growth stopped. And if you use a GA and you don't know exactly how the rate's going to work, you can very quickly be pushing down the accelerator and gunning it. And then you get floppy growth like we see in the, the calla lily. Um, on the, in the photograph. The safety factor there dictates that if it's my crop, then the only, only recommendation I give to growers is to use the combination, either a fascination or a fresco. Because you get some moderation going on with the BA to offset some of the stimulation that comes with the GA. It, it's a better looking plant with that combination. So you need to use the combination. And it's, and it's registered so you can do that. So on the next slide, this just shows that a grower was trying to overcome some poor plugs and applied GA, overdid it, and the plant on the left had too much growth. And so it is sometimes difficult to figure out what's going on, but you, sometimes these tools will not overcome some, some major problems with the plant that, that, that's, uh, that you have going on. You cannot always salvage what's going on, but you can overcome some PGR overdoses. The, these plants stalled. It was two different crops, and they didn't get what they wanted. So, you know, um, it, it, it works very well, but it doesn't do miracles. That's what I'm saying. So <laughs> on the next slide, here, here is the, the getting into the meat of, of, of what's there. So both of these chemicals have a combination of GA and BA. 
You can do a misprazer, it stretches to overcome the, the stunning effect of an anti-GAPGR, uh, such as any of the paclobutrazoles, the uniconazoles, the acimidols, the fluoroprimidols. Um, it, it, it would work for um, um, the cyclocell types, but typically plants grow out of it, and you, you're not worried about it. It would work for overcoming an overdose of dazide or dimenazide or uh, B9, but you know the plant's going to grow out of it, so it's not really a concern. It will not uh, change the effects of like an overdose of, of Florel, for instance, because that's not that mode of action is different, and you're not affecting that that growth the same way. So the label rates are on the next slide, and so it's it's pretty wide open for what you need to do. So with the next slide, Chris. Okay. There's a lot of work, words there, so here's the bottom line. Somewhere between, and, and the 1-1 one, one is the GABA, so basically it's one part per million. Until you know what you're doing, you can try somewhere between probably a 1 and a 3 part per million. You apply it to the plant, you see if the plant grows out of it after five to seven days. And if not, you can increase the rate slightly or reapply at the same rate. The magic number on a lot of crops is about three parts per million. If it's really stunted, you might try five. I would not go up to 10. Uh, 10 things can get really funky and start growing out, and then you get to go back and apply another paclobutrazole application to stop the plant from going crazy. So until you're comfortable, do some trials. You know, it's a standard response, you know, until you know what you're doing and, and how a cultivar might respond. But the one to three is a magic spot. And, and the question that came up earlier is you have to apply it early enough so you can stimulate that extra growth uh, to make it for market. So there's not really a window um, to avoid, only a window to make sure you have enough time for that plant to get bigger. So with the next slide, um, so if you have an overdose, double check your math, uh, make sure it's not a mimic, and then use some of these tools to help overcome those PGR overdoses. The Fresco fascination application works very well. So finally, in the last section is some PGR resources just to make you aware of. The first one is we do eGrow Alert newsletters. On the next slide, if you click on the Alert tab, and the next screen comes up, you can subscribe where that orange button is, or you can text the eGrow at 22828. Also, there's some other resources on the next slide that's out there. Um, we'll go over each one of those to so the next slide. Um, there's some podcasts that we have up uh, on the Greenhouse Grower website that you can look at. They're categorized, so you can see those. You can also get to them from the eGrow website. Uh, the next slide has some great websites, Purdue, Michigan State, Virginia Tech, Fine Americas has some good information. So all those are up there to give you resources of trying to determine optimal rates and some techniques that you want to end up using. The next slide has an iBook that Joyce Latimer and I did. Uh, you can get to it from the eGrow website. So if you have an iPad, it, it's, a, it's a pretty basic, it's a, it's a beginner overview type of a of a book. Uh, it's not advanced, but that, that is available. The next information is uh, the, the just published PGR guide with grower talks and fine. Uh, we did floral crops. If you have a, 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 a grower talk subscription, you should have received it in the mail. Otherwise, you can download the PDF from the Fine America's website. And next year in January, uh, we will have the, uh, the perennial guide. Brian Krug did the Mix Master, um, uh, so on the phone you can do iPhone, Android of, of doing calculation of mixing. Uh, that uh, I think it was uh, Eero Alert 1.11. If you want to go back and look at that information, and then we also came up with on the next slide uh, there is a web-based. Uh, it's not a great calculator, but it's a suggested rate uh, app. Uh, the eGrow uh, address is down at the bottom, e-grow.mobi.index.php. And so you then open it up in the middle, you choose the crop, 
On the next slide, once you know you select which plant, in this case here, Ageratum, and then it will give you the registered rates either from the label, research trials, or grower recommendations for that particular crop. So it, it, another tool, it's like your, your, your fingertips to get things done. The next slide, I believe, is it's the OHP rate calculator for their products, Agio, B9, Cyclocell, and Paxol. So that's also a nice calculator that you can use to help uh, calculate those rates. So with that, I do believe that's the last slide. So with that, we'll open it up for some questions, Chris. Brian, excellent information. And um, we answered a few of the questions along the way, but we've gotten some more here. So let me, uh, let me go after a few of them. Uh, let's see, somebody asked, uh, Clark asked if you can drench, no, let's see, we already asked that one. Uh, somebody was asking if you can drench with Fresco, and you had answered that one uh, in one of your slides. You, you, you can use it as a drench or a spray, correct? Yes. And point said is, uh, John Dolt did a trial two years ago when the drench rates were, uh, the, the, the end results of getting stimulating growth on poinsettias were much, much superior on a drench than it was on a foliar spray. There was some uh, chance of some phyto and distortion that occurred on some, some poinsettia cultivars with the spray. All right. Mark wants to know if PGRs can, can vaporize and can that drift or somehow affect other crops? So in other words, not a spray uh, drift, but actually sort of vapors from an, an applied uh, an application. Boy, no, no one's ever asked that question. Um, I don't think. I mean, when I, my answer to that is going to be no, and, and you know, and I'm basing this purely on we do a lot of trials, and we, you know, the untreated controls they're randomly assigned throughout the greenhouse, and we always have extra plants. I, I don't I don't see any effect that's going on with that. Um, now there was some work done earlier that you it, this is kind of a tangent, but um, if if you have too fast a drying on those leaves, because ideally you want about four hours of drying, that's why you apply a foliar spray early or late in the day. Uh, you can go back and remiss those leaves the next day, and a lot of times you'll get another 10% control just by re-wetting it. You're not washing it off, you're just misting it. Uh, so, you know, you, the, the chemical's there, but I don't think it's going over to affect other crops. Gotcha. All right, Jason wants to know, uh, when it comes to overcoming an overdose, could time and maybe warmer temps be another way to, uh, to do it? How about extra feed, uh, especially a high phosphorus feed? Yeah, the, and that was one of the slides, and he might have asked that before I hit that slide. But yeah, you can switch to more of an ammoniacal uh, phosphorus feed. The ammoniacal leaf ex causes leaf expansion or stimulates leaf expansion, and the phosphorus gives you stem elongation. So as long as you're only marginally over, I think you're, you're, you can grow the plants out. But if you really stalled them back, uh, that's where probably your only feasible tool is going to be something like a, a, a fresco fascination application. Yeah, generally when we're talking overdose, you're going to have a tough time growing out of that under uh, in a timely fashion, maybe in, you know, a couple of months, but economic, not yeah. sales timing, yeah. Yeah, in an economically sales-driven situation, uh, you're probably going to have to pull out uh, the chemical application. Right. Okay. Jim wants to know if you can use Fresco to overcome uh, accidental growth regulation from a DMI fungicide. Yeah. So it would work the same. It's the same effect because uh, the Paclos, you know, Bonsai was was in the um, uh, fungicide trials when they initially discovered it. Uh, so they had the they had the same mode of action. So yes, that would help help offset the same effect. All right, uh, and we're going to just tackle one more question before it's going to be time to go. This is from an end user, not a grower. I thought this would be appropriate. Uh, Thomas occasionally suspects uh, maybe a bit of PGR carryover uh, on wax begonias, coincidentally. He's wondering if you could apply fresco or something similar in 
the field, I guess the landscape, if evidence point, points to a PGR overdose. Not even sure if it's labeled for that, but what say you, Brian? I, I, I don't think it's labeled that the same principle is would work, I mean, because you're, you're overcoming that same effect. Uh, ideally, if you see there's a problem, uh, the application should be made before you transplant. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, when you look at the price of that chemical, it's very inexpensive, especially when you're applying one part per million or three parts per million. Um, so it, it, you could e easily do the treatment before you transplant. I think the REI, and I ha I'd have to go back and look, I think the REI is about 12 hours, though, on that one. So you have to allow that time factor from application, let it sit for those hours before your workers would transplant them. Okay. Any tips for landscape, though? Because we sometimes hear about, uh, you know, sometimes consumers might suspect that, hey, these plants aren't growing, what am I doing wrong? And it actually is maybe a little too much... Uh, uh, pack low. Yeah, fertilizer and water. Very high fertilizer and water. If, if if it's only moderately overdosed, again, you'll get uh, once those roots get out in the soil, it will start growing. And by the end of the season, uh, from, from some experiments we have had on grow out, you'll see very similar sized plants. But if if it's a very high dose. Uh, those plants just cannot get established, and usually they die of drought stress because, the, you know, the effects you see on the top of the plant is also occurring on the root system of the plant. And so it's very difficult to get those root hairs out and growing and get it, getting the plant uh, starting to uh, put on good growth. In other words, complain to your grower if that's the case. All right, well, if you've got more questions, there were a couple in here that uh, were getting pretty, uh, really, uh, uh, beyond the scope of this webinar. Um, but you can email Brian those questions directly. Watch out, Brian, they're going to be coming uh, at bwipker at ncsu.edu. I'm sure he'd love to talking about this PGR stuff. It's what he does. And um, if you want to go back into this webinar to kind of go over some of those detailed slides that we went by kind of quickly, you could easily do that. Uh, probably within an hour or two, we should have it up and ready to go at ballpublishing.com uh, slash webinars, the same place you registered for this. And you can scroll through the webinar. You don't have to sit and listen to the entire thing. And uh, we actually have some uh, another upcoming webinar, Wednesday, March 25th. Uh, learn about hydroponic lettuce, a beginner's guide to starting and finishing quality plants. That's uh, in conjunction with Oasis uh, Grower Products and J.R. Peters and Company. So I will be hosting that one for you. And uh, hey, speaking of sponsors, one last big thank you to uh, Fine Americas for sponsoring this webinar and bringing us Dr. Brian Whipker. Well, Brian, thanks so much uh, for participating. We greatly appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Uh, and so th that wraps up another Ball Publishing webinar for Brian and his crew at NC State and all the good folks at Fine Americas and all my peeps here at Ball Publishing. This is Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody.